I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, good morning. Praise God. Isn't God good? Amen and amen and amen. I want to get into this very quickly this morning. I believe in Jesus Christ. Today we're looking at the ninth tenet as I uh, refer to them. They're actually not numbered in the creed itself. But it's the simple fact that I believe in Jesus Christ. From whence he shall come. Now, if you were here last week, if you caught us on, online, either way, you understand we were talking about he ascended to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God Almighty. Today, we're talking about from where he's going to come from. Where he is today, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, those of you that are joining us online what a glorious day the Lord has given us, and what a blessing it is to be able to come together and to share Jesus' word to us, God's holy word, and may it, bring, may it bring honor to God, and may it encourage and strengthen each of us as well. Let's pray very quickly. Father, we thank you again for your word. We pray, O oh Lord, for just a special outpouring of your spirit Lord, as we're looking for this glorious time, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we know that we're closer than we've ever been, and Lord, as we look at the, the times around us, we look at the things taking place around us, we know, oh God, that it can't be too much longer before Jesus comes back. Lord God, I just pray for your anointing, I pray for your empowerment, I pray, oh God, that you would bless in a very special way by your power in Jesus' name. Amen. Moving forward today, we've talked about the ascension of Jesus. We've talked about his being uh, on his throne today, making constant intercession for you and I. And today we're looking at this phrase, I believe in Jesus Christ, from whence he shall come, we know that is heaven, to judge the living and the dead. Not only is Jesus our Savior, but Jesus is also going to one day be the judge. Praise God, my sins were judged at the cross because I have turned my heart and life over to Jesus Christ. The punishment for my sins was taken by him on that cross. The punishment for the sins of all humanity was taken on that cross. But until we come into Christ Jesus by surrendering our hearts and lives to him, there is still a judgment yet to come. We're going to be looking at these things today, and we're going to be talking about some things that really just came to my heart and mind this week as I was writing this message and, and some questions that kept coming to my heart and, and things that kept coming to my mind, uh, things that are popular, things that are, that are preached a lot. And, and yet I couldn't find exactly how some of these things fit into the scripture in which they had been uh, often preached into. And uh, I think uh, as I'm looking at this today as an, uh, and as I'm sharing these things with you, I would hope that your heart would be open to see these things and to understand 
some more about the last days. And perhaps once we complete this um, sermon series uh, in the very near future, maybe we will go in and we'll consider more of end time study. Uh, we're living in that time. It's an exciting time. Uh, the day that we're living in, even though it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's chaotic, it's crazy, and yet it's exciting because we know that Jesus is on the throne. He is ruling and reigning today, and we praise God for that. I want you to keep in mind that I am not preaching the creed, rather I am using it to establish a systematic study of the basic of biblical doctrines. And I want to remind you also that the creed was established for two main reasons. To correct error, we see a lot of error today in the church, we see error in various false religions out there. Also, the second purpose was to be used as a tool for the spiritual formation of God's people. The text I want to be considering today comes from Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be looking at verses 31 through 46. This is what the scripture says. When the Son of Man, remember Son of Man was a, was a title Jesus often used to speak of himself. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and he'll put the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. But then he will also say to those on the left, depart from me, you, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me either. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, we need to understand something about this particular passage of Scripture. This particular text is taken from Jesus. It was his response to a question that the disciples had asked him. Beginning in, verse, uh, in chapter 24, in verse 3, the disciples asked him, Tell us, when will these things happen? happen. Now, Jesus had been talking about the destruction of the temple. He had been talking about not one stone being left on another. And then he continued to talk about these last day's events. And then they asked him, the second question was, what is the sign of your coming and the end of this age? Now, very often we, we we can read his response. It's done in a series of parables throughout the rest of chapter 24 and into and throughout chapter 25 of Matthew. And these are the response of Jesus. Now, I want to clarify something as we begin looking at this today. 
This is talking about, his response is not concerning the rapture. His response is the second coming, his second coming. These are two separate events yet to happen, separated by seven years of tribulation and great tribulation. Let me, let me go into a little more detail. While the rapture begins prior to the beginning of the tribulation, the second coming of Christ takes place at the end. It's, it's the culminating point of the tribulation period. Uh, and it is at that time then that the 1,000-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ takes place followed by the great white throne judgment. So we need to look at these things in perspective. The next great event that's going to happen is the rapture of the church. And then we understand at that point, at some point thereafter, the seven years of tribulation which Daniel talked about, the seven years that is spoken of in Scripture, begins to take place. And Daniel perhaps did the greatest uh, uh, work into this, especially of the great tribulation outside of the book of Revelation. And, and so what happens is the, the rapture has not at the time of this passage of Scripture yet been revealed. Understand that Jesus didn't reveal the rapture. Nobody even understood the rapture. He, he kind of reflected towards it at times, but he never gave an understanding of the rapture. Why was that? Because the church had not yet been birthed. And with the birthing of the church was the adoption of the Gentile people. Remember, he is speaking in Matthew 24 and 25. He is relating to the Jewish people. He's talking about the Jewish temple. He's talking about the nation of Israel. The Jewish people are still looking for a leader who's going to rise up for the purpose of bringing them up to the place that they feel they are supposed to be and really initiating in an earthly kingdom. They want to crown him on Palm Sunday. They want him to take control for the Israelite nation away from Rome and once again put them in control of the Holy Land. That's why on that day they see him as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and five short days later they're yelling crucify him because he didn't do what they wanted him to do. They, their whole perspective of the reason that Jesus came the first time was all askewed. It was all messed up. They didn't understand that Jesus had to first pay the sin price. He had to go to the cross before he could establish his kingdom. Otherwise, he would have nobody in his kingdom because there is none righteous, no, not one. So what we're looking at here, and I, I want you to understand that the, the, the rapture was initiated by Paul. The, the talk of the, nap, of the rapture, bringing up of the rapture, actually was given to Paul to, to bring about. And, and let me show you that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul says, listen, I'm telling you a mystery. Okay, up to this time, the rapture was not a mystery to God. It was fully known to God. It was not something that all of a sudden came to God's mind. And he says, oh, we, we need a rapture. We need, we need this to happen. No, what happens here is Paul is tasked with this. The church has been birthed. Gentiles have been adopted in. And now you have Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. And he's telling you, I'm telling you a mystery. I'm showing you a mystery. And here we go, we're not all going to sleep, he says. But we are going to all be changed in a moment. Remember, he's writing to believers here now. He said, in, the, in a blink of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will all be changed. We often overlook that word mystery. 
we, we think, what, what, what it, what's this have to do with anything? Well, Paul is very careful in all of his writings and everything he's got to say, and he is revealing to us something new. He is, he is heralding out this thing for the church, for the born-again believers in Jesus Christ. Because the Jewish people have rejected their Messiah and they crucified him. They got rid of him because he didn't do what they wanted him to do. And so God comes in and he adopts the Gentile nation. And you know, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of friction about that initially. Peter had a lot of problems with it until the sheet came down out of heaven and, and God showed him. He said, take and eat. And Peter says, oh no, I've never eaten any of these things. They're, these are unclean. And yet God said to Peter, said, don't ever call unclean what I have called clean. And he's, he's, he's bringing in this idea in, in Acts chapter 15 uh, at the Jerusalem council, they call Paul and Barnabas in, and they say, what are you doing preaching to the, uh, to the Gentile nations? What are, what are you doing trying to bring them into the kingdom? And there was this first council in Jerusalem, and it was determined at that point that it was the will of God. Peter got up, and he shared, of course, his vision, and they, they talked about all of these things uh, very clearly here, and it was understood that God has initiated a new kingdom. He, has, he is putting this whole thing into play. Now I want to go back into these passages that I've already read, our text passage, and I want to look at this in this perspective. It says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Now, we have to ask ourselves, is he coming in his glory in the rapture? No, he's coming in the clouds simply to call his church out, simply to call his people out. And it says, and he's coming with his angels, and he's going to sit on his throne of glory. Well, we know that doesn't happen. At this point in time, following the rapture, but rather we understand what happens at that very point in time is the, the tribulation begins, the Antichrist rises to power, and what happens is the Antichrist tries for seven years, especially the last three and a half, to annihilate the nation of Israel because Satan understands that when God has promised something, he is not going to ever turn his back on it. He understands that God has made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, way back, that his, his people are God's special people. And they remain to this day, even though they're going through perilous times. The Jewish people, most of them are, uh, are, are not uh, God seekers, God worshipers whatsoever. Certainly you have Messianic Jews, which are ones who have recognized that Jesus is the Messiah, and they, like you and I, will go up in the rapture. But what takes place is then for seven years, we see the Antichrist, Satan himself, trying his very best to stop the plan of God by destroying the nation of Israel. And we understand Armageddon is the culmination of all of that. So it says, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he's going to put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, I've, I've always had problems with this because most times, most preachers will tell you, well, he's... he's He's reflecting to the great uh, white throne judgment here. Well, if you go over to Revelation and you read about the, white, the great white throne judgment, he raises up all of those who have, uh, who have died without Jesus Christ. That, that judgment is just for those who have died without Jesus Christ. But here he's talking about some sheep and he's talking about some goats. And, and it doesn't plug into the great white throne. And Jesus hasn't talked about all of these other things. He's talking about when he comes. Okay, we know he's coming. 
at the end of the seven years for the purpose of setting up his throne in Jerusalem where he will reign for a thousand years. So what is going on here is there is really a judgment that takes place at the end of the tribulation. Well, who's, who's he judging? Who's he looking at? Those who have come out of the tribulation. Those both who have lost their, lost their heads, been martyred for their faith, as well as those who have refused to take the mark of the beast versus those who have taken the mark. You see the sheep and the goats. Do you see what's beginning to take place here? Immediately following the, uh, the, the battle of Armageddon, the end of the tribulation period, and moving into the reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years, he's got to eliminate off of this earth those who have come out of the tribulation whose intentions, I'm not going to say they were saved, whose intentions were right versus those who were wrong. Because notice when he begins talking about these things here, he talks about those who have done good deeds versus those who didn't. Those who have fed, those who have clothed, those who have ministered to others, those who have served versus those who have refused to do any of it. Now you say, well, I thought when the tribulation period was over that basically it was all you know, everybody was pretty much dead. No, there's, there's, there's many who come out of the tribulation period. They, they survived the tribulation period. We know it's going to be bad. We know a third of all humanity is going to be wiped out. We know a lot of things about it. But after that battle of Armageddon, when Jesus comes back in the midst of that battle and puts an end to it, there's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a separation, if you will. Those who have taken the mark, those who have refused to help others, those who have, have, uh, have lived horrible lives, those who have worshipped the Antichrist, all of these are those goats he's talking about versus those who have tried to help one another. Now understand what happens to believers. During the seven-year tribulation period, what takes place is number one is the, the Bema judgment. Not a judgment based upon whether you are a believer or not because you're there, but based upon what you did once you became a Christian. Once you were born again, what did you do for the sake? Did you do gold things and silver things or did you do these, these things that are going to burn up when put through the fire? See, what we're doing right now is really establishing our placement in the millennial kingdom. So there are crowns, there are awards that are given at this time. Nobody is cast out of heaven during the beam of seed. Well, you know, you didn't do anything, get out of here. No, but there are rewards and also there is an establishment of, of, of uh, how you will reign alongside of Jesus Christ during the millennial kingdom. We'll get into that at another point. But, but So you've got this Bema, and then you've got the marriage supper of the Lamb. So two events take place during the tribula while the tribulation period is taking place on this earth. And so following those things, then the Bible tells us that Jesus returns in the middle of the, uh, the battle of Armageddon. Israel is about to be demolished off of the face of the earth as all the armies of the world have gathered around in the valley of Megiddo with the intent of destruction of this little bitty tiny nation of people. Now we understand that Satan's in control of all that's going on down here at that time, leading the Antichrist, leading these armies to come. And the whole purpose behind it all is the destruction and the annihilation of God's plan. Let me tell you, folks, that's what's going on today in our world. You know, we're, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. and We're, we're fighting against principalities and powers 
Satan is trying every day, every way he possibly can to tweak God's plan, to mess up God's plan, to bring an end to God's plan because he knows that eventually he's going to be cast into the pit. Satan is very well aware of his future. And that's why he's got to put an end to this. He's got to stop God's plan. God's plan will move forward. It will continue moving forward. So what happens then when Jesus comes back, Revelation tells us that all the saints are with him. Of course, Jesus alone, the sword comes out of his mouth, the word of God, and he annihilates those that are gathered on that battlefield that day. Well, then he establishes his throne in Jerusalem, and it is at this point that I believe this particular passage of Scripture comes into play because he's got to establish his reign. And the Bible tells us that during his millennial reign, he will reign with a rod of iron. So so there are going to be unsaved people. People are going to continue uh, uh, reproducing, continue having children, And what ends up happening? At the end of the thousand-year reign, the Scripture tells us that Satan is loosed once again for a short time. Why? Because all of these people that have come out of the tribulation as well as those that have been born during that thousand-year reign must still make a decision to choose Jesus or to reject Him. The Bible tells us very clearly that a Satan gets together a great army. So there's still a great army of, of non-believers, of people who rebel against Jesus at the end of that thousand years of, of prosperity. Even in the midst of a prosperous world that Jesus has been in control of, the Bible tells us that Satan is able to get together a vast army of individuals with the intent of going into Jerusalem and destroying Jesus off the throne, which we know doesn't work. And it brings in and initiates the great white throne judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're looking back at this. We're looking at this separation of the sheep and goats. We understand that the the separation of the sheep and goats cannot be the great white throne judgment. But rather, it's a purging of the earth in preparation for the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. you got to get rid of those who took the mark. got to get rid of uh, those who who did not serve serve others. Because Jesus wants to bring in a society of service, of love, of, of goodness, of mercy, of grace, of all these great uh, attributes. And so he's got to start with a fairly clean slate here. And so what we're looking at, what Jesus is talking about here, is he's talking about these things that are taking place. So so what happens, he says, then what Jesus comes along, and beginning in verse 34, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. So in other words, this, this kingdom has been in the mind of God since the very beginning of creation, he says. I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Now during the tribulation period, all of those things are going to be uh, very needy but very difficult to carry out as well because everyone is going to be suffering tremendously during that time. It's going to be hard to buy and sell. If you don't take the mark of the beast, we know that you're going to have to go out and rummage. There isn't going to be going down to the store to get anything because you can't buy and sell. You see our society slowly drifting into a lot of these things, preparing our world for the initiation, the bringing in of the Antichrist, bringing in this one world government, bringing in this one world religion. We, we're seeing the, the, the Pope making all kinds of deals with other faiths and other religions, bringing together the culmination of a one world religion. 
All of these things, if you watch what's going on in the world today, these are pieces of the puzzle that are just snapping into place. As never before, we're seeing these things happen. But there are those people who are going to go out of their way to help others to eat, to help others to have clothes, to help others to have something to drink. And these are blessed because they have blessed others. And so these are what are called the sheep. And so he says, um, you know, we, we think about this and we think, well, this is kind of, uh, kind of a strange means of determining an individual's righteousness. I want to take you, though, back to Matthew 7, 16 for a minute. And leading up to this verse, Jesus had spoke about the narrow gate versus the wide gate. And I'm going to tell you that we think it's difficult to get saved today. It's going to be even more difficult. That, that gate's going to get even more narrow as you go into the tribulation period and you try to determine yourself um, to, be, uh, to, to be worthy of, to be able, to be capable of getting to the truth. Because that door of truth, as we're seeing in our world today, is slowly closing. What is truth? There is hardly any truth today in anything. And that is only going to become worse and worse because Satan is the father of lies. So he says, you're going to recognize them by their fruit. You're going to recognize them by their actions. You're going to recognize them by what they've done. And then he follows up this verse in uh, verse 21, and he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he said, only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So he's, he's, he's piecing all these things together. Remember that the book of Matthew was written mainly to the Jewish people so they would have an understanding of the gospel message, God's message of Jesus Christ. And so he's speaking to all of these things. I want you to understand the value that Christ places upon our willingness to be his hand extended. You understand that Jesus is saying that your personal experience with Christ is going to result in Christ-like actions. We say, well, you know, it's, it's easy to be a Christian. I, you know, I... I I made my profession of faith, I walked the aisle, I did this and I did that. But there is a lot more to it than that, folks. God wants us to be fruit bearers. He wants us to reveal to the world what the kingdom of heaven is like. He wants us to picture to the world, to the lost in this world, what they're missing out on by turning their backs or refusing the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus says in verses 37 to 40. He says, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? Clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And he said, I assure you, whatever you did to any of these brothers of mine. What was Jesus? He was a Jew. These brothers of mine. He says, you did it to me. Notice that the righteous question their righteousness as they're standing before the king of kings. They find themselves odd that Christ would characterize what they had assumed to be such little things to be of such great value to him. But then Jesus turns to those on his left and the scripture tells us, he says to those, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me something to drink to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison or not help you? And he answered them, I assure you, whatever you did did not do for one of the least of these you did not do for me either and they will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life 
Now, let me tell you something I, I referenced uh, a few minutes ago, and I didn't really get around to saying to you. We, as believers, are preparing ourselves to reign and to rule alongside Jesus Christ in the millennial kingdom. We will, by our actions, by our servanthood, by our service to one another and to the kingdom of God, we are setting up, we are establishing ourselves into places of authority in God's kingdom. We, therefore, we will reign alongside of Him. We will rule alongside of Him. We will be His emissaries. Now, while those around us in this world who have come out of the tribulation and been born during the millennial kingdom, certainly they will, they, they will have to choose Christ again. We are permanently sealed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have become into Christ Jesus through our acceptance of Him in this life, and we have determined for ourselves an eternity, an assurance of an eternity that shall never end. And we will reign with Him. Now I want to take you over to Revelation 20 for just a minute as I begin to bring this to a close. I want you to understand I've only hit the high spots and I've hit them as fast as I could. A great deal has been overlooked. It's a short study today. But I want you to understand the return of Christ and the establishment of His kingdom and His reign. And understand what we're talking about here. In Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15 now, we're going to look at the great white throne, and you're going to see how this doesn't fit into his Matthew 25 passage. John the Revelator says, Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. He says, I also saw the dead. Now, we don't see that mentioned at all in, in Jesus uh, speaking in Matthew. He said, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Now, there were no books opened. The separation of sheep and goats was just based upon what they had done to one another. But he says, I saw all the books open." And the dead were judged, here we go, they were judged according to their works by what was written in these books. He said, then I saw the sea, it gave up its dead, and death and Hades, they gave up their dead. All were judged according to their works. So death and Hades gave up their dead. So those who had been condemned, the goats, now must come once again and stand before the great white throne judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, this is the second death. The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, this is a horrible but a promised ending for all who reject the free gift of salvation. Jesus Christ came. He gave his life. Died a horrible death. Took the judgment of the sins of all people upon himself. The wrath of God was poured out upon him as he hung on that cross. He did it out of his love for you and me and his obedience to the will of the Father. You know, I, I can't, I can't even begin to understand how people could reject so great a salvation. And yet you go into the world today and you try to witness to somebody and they don't want to hear it. I want you to hear it. I want you to know that you know that Jesus is your Savior today. In a few moments, we're going to be taking communion together. 
Before we do, I want you to know that you know that Jesus is your Savior. It says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, do you believe Jesus is alive today? Do you believe Jesus is alive and seated on the throne? Amen. Amen. And I can declare He is my King today. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. Can you do likewise? If not, I want to encourage you to turn your heart and life over to Jesus today. I want to encourage you to invite Christ to become the Lord and Savior of your life. Father, as you're speaking to hearts through your spirit today, Lord, I pray for every heart, the ones watching us by the internet, the ones that are gathered in this room. Lord, I just pray right now. I pray, oh God, that by your spirit, you would move in our hearts, move in our lives. Help us to recognize the path that you trod up that hill to pay for our sin. Lord, to understand what it means to serve you. Being faithful unto you, trusting in you, believing you today. Lord, we bless you and praise you in Jesus' name.